Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. And it's my pleasure to welcome attendees and this distinguished panel on a really optimistic subject for once. Uh, seems, seems to be most of our panels have been about bad news and how to fix it, but this is really good news. And so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Brittany Light of Honolulu Civil Beat, who will be moderating this panel. Not Thomas Heaton as advertised, <laughs> but uh, you're in very good hands. Aloha. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. Um, yes, and uh, good evening, everyone. We're so happy to have you joining us for a conversation at the intersection of food sustainability and aquaculture. As Roger said, my name is Brittany Light. I'm a reporter at Honolulu Civil Beat. Um, as you can tell, I'm not Thomas Heaton, unfortunately. He's uh, on deadline tonight, so I'm jumping in to help. Um, but I also report on agriculture as well as a wide range of other topics, including social issues with a geographic focus on our neighbor islands. Um, I'm joining you from Kauai today, and I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, first off, I'd love to thank uh, all of you attendees for joining us today. I'd love if you could type your name and where you're from into the chat box, just so we can see who's here. And Throughout this presentation, if you have questions for our panelists, please put those into the chat as well. We won't get to them right away, but we will reserve the last 15 minutes of our hour together for your questions. So as you, as you think of them, drop them into the chat. Um, our panelists this, this evening are Dylan Howell from Hatch Blue on the Big Island and Todd Lowe from the Hawaii State Department of Agriculture. Together, we'll be discussing shellfish and seaweed as potent forms of restorative aquaculture that require minimal feed, fresh water, or land. We'll focus on how shellfish and seaweed can improve water quality and so many other uh, environmental benefits, social benefits, economic benefits. Um, and uh, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about our panelists before we start off. Uh, Dylan Howell is the Operations and Development Manager for Hatch Blue's branch in Kailua Kona on the Big Island. Hatch Blue is an innovation and venture capital company exclusively focused on sustainable and climate smart seafood systems. It has a global presence with offices in Hawaii, Europe, Asia, and it works with governments, NGOs, research organizations, industry, and new ventures. Uh, as an aquaculture specialist with global experience, Dylan's industry expertise and extensive fieldwork on practical production technologies and market research cover the breadth of shrimp, shellfish, salmon, and various other types of farms across Asia, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and North America. So Dylan, thanks so much for being with us. Um, I'd also like to introduce at depth Todd Lowe, who is the manager of the Aquaculture and Livestock Support Services Branch in the Animal Industry Division of the Hawaii State Agriculture Department. He previously held the manager position at the Aquaculture Development Program and Market Development Program, and he is responsible for developing and sustaining commercial aquaculture in Hawaii, which has increased in value from $25 million in 2007 to $80 million in 2021, which is pretty significant growth. Um, so welcome to our panelists, welcome attendees. And um, yeah, I'm going to pass this over first to Todd. He's going to start with the basics of what is aquaculture and, and then get into some of the nitty gritty with us. Great. Thanks, Brittany. Hello, everyone. I'm Todd Lowe, and I am. I will share my screen. Hold on one second here. Oops. Okay. Everybody, see that? All right, Brittany. You can yes. See okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Todd. I work for the State Department of Agriculture and I'm in charge of aquaculture development. 
And I have a few slides. So today we're gonna to just go over, this is just kind of a brief outline. Again, the background of the, the topic of the day, which is the, um, actually it's 2022, sorry about that, restorative aquaculture report. Um, what is the aquaculture development program? Kind of defining regenerative ag and what how restorative aquaculture fits into that. And um, looking a little bit about what's going on with restorative aquaculture currently in Hawaii and then um, seeing how we're gonna move forward. Okay, so um, starting last year, the Department of Ag um, wanted to start the ball rolling and to set a foundational piece about restorative aquaculture. So we sent out an RFP and a company called Hatch, which Dylan will get into further, responded. And the result is a um, Hawaii's Ocean Opportunity Report. And the first bullet point, it's a mouthful, but that's basically what we're trying to do. It was to create a report that analyzed how further commercial development of restorative aquaculture initiatives could present a cost-effective and market-driven opportunity to help restore coastal ecosystems. And um, that's a lot of words, right? But the real, the point is to, um, of it, this encapsulates sort of the restorative aquaculture view that it has to be um, cost-effective and market-driven along with the environmental benefits that come with um, the, uh, the activities that we're doing. Um, so there's a picture of the cover sheet and um, on our, I have a link to the report and um, the DOA website. Um, Dylan may have another link outside for his website, but you can find it there. Um, just to confuse everybody, the link is to the Aquaculture and Livestock Support Services branch. And I wear sort of two hats, but we both do the same thing. Um, Aquaculture, there is a, officially a thing called the Aquaculture Development Program, ADP and also something called the Aquaculture and Livestock Support Services Branch. Um, both of those are in the Animal Industry Division in DOA. Okay, so Department of Ag, um, you, may, you guys may or may not know it, we are focused on commercial agriculture. And typically that's been about food systems and food development. Um, so my focus is primarily previously been on commercial aquaculture development. Um, however, with the going into the animal industry division and the reason we're called aquaculture and livestock support services now is that we're looking to, um, as it says on the slide, leverage synergy between the livestock sectors. So if you take, if you get high enough, you're gonna, you'd see that um, all the livestock sectors have high cost of feed, right? Um, we all have to keep the animals um, healthy, to, regardless of whether it's a, a cow, a pig, a chicken, or a fish. Um, on the market side, there's immense pressures from imports, and we all have land and water constraints. Um, species specific, of course, but everybody has those same, that's what links us all on the livestock side. So um, I'll get into, talk a little bit of the other livestock, but um, we also look at livestock these other sectors along with aquaculture. Um, for the aquaculture side, um, I have three kind of main focuses. Um, the left side is commercial activity. That's typically um, been the fish for food kind of thing and um, really focusing on the business side. This new restorative aquaculture focus brings in an environmental restorative concept that um, is a, it's a new area for us. And um, underpinning everything has to be what we call support equipment and services, but that's really about innovation. That's about um, bringing in new technologies and new science that can support the two other circles. And um, that's what, um, as you'll hear more from Dylan, that's what Hatch provides a, a very interesting piece toward that. Um, also, the other point is, is that we're looking at technologies that are started in other industries that can move over into agriculture. We're starting to see that in um, other ag sectors and um, aquaculture is a prime um, recipient of technologies from wastewater treatment, 
from um, uh, biofuels. There, there's a bunch of different industries that deal with the same kind of issues that we can bring over. Um, and you know we can talk a little bit more about later. Okay, so what is regenerative ag and what is restorative aquaculture? So we wanted to, I wanted to cover this in a few slides so that gives people sort of a common ground to work from. Um, this, and this is from my perspective, obviously. So restorative aquaculture is a subset of regenerative ag. And um, you, regenerative agriculture really is a hot topic out there today in the ag world. Um, and for, to break it down in our case, um, we have the terrestrial farming side and then we have the livestock side. So we have regenerative cattle grazing, pre and natural farming, which goes over fish and swine and poultry, and um, my topic, which is restorative aquaculture. Um, each of these topics that are yet to be pretty deep and we can, we can circle back on them if you want to, but I just wanted to give you sort of where we fit in the bigger picture. Um, so for the, the terrestrial farming, um, there is a large movement globally and on the mainland, really. I think that um, the Farm Bureau, not the Farm Bureau, the um, CTAR just got a really large grant just recently to work with the cattle guys to look at the soils um, in terms of their grazing and um, the carbon footprint or the carbon sequestration of it in Hawaii, which is a big deal. So they're starting to move on that. But in general, um, terrestrial um, regenerative farming on the, the crop side is really about building organic uh, soil, organic matter and biodiversity, uh, decreasing the use of chemical import inputs and um, capturing carbon to combat climate change. Okay, so in the livestock side, um, we'll start again a little bit with the cattle. Um, we, this one is, is talking about really rest rotation cycles, which are sh for shorter periods, followed by dense grazing, and um, that are support, regen uh, support more quicker vegetative recovery. So these are, um, these are temporary paddocks that they're moving the, the cattle through and they just don't let them graze. They, they focus their efforts and they move them quickly. So the cattle doesn't eat the, um, forage down to the roots and that it's, it was, it's able to come back a lot quicker and they don't have um, areas where there's no vegetation. Pre and natural farming is actually really interesting. Um, in, in our case, it started of course in Korea. They use a thing called indigenous microorganisms um, and they inoculate the soil underneath, in this case, the swine. And it takes away, completely takes away the need to have these settling ponds, which are really stink and um, are kind of an environmental impact of their own. Um, the, the microorganisms eat the feces and the urine, so there is no runoff, it's completely dry. Um, that's a whole nother area that I think we can, we can look at it, um, in, in my role to look outside of aquaculture, we're really gonna, um, be focusing on Korean natural farming and the science behind what's going into the soil and how this works so we can get um, more production out of them. If you've never been, if you've been to a hog farm before, maybe you haven't, it's the smell is almost overwhelming and there's, you're inundated with flies. In these new systems, Korean natural farming system, there's hardly any flies and there's almost no smell. So in Korea, they're able to put them near much closer or even include them inside urban areas. Uh, typically we couldn't do that before. So anyway, this really changes the game for the spine production. Okay, so um, let's, see. let's talk about restorative aquaculture. So restorative aquaculture is a combination of environmental, the environmental aspects and the, the business side of the game. So on the left side, we're really looking at ocean health, habitat res restoration and restorative ecology. On the right side, of course, it's the typical or the traditional aquaculture focuses on food or other commercial products for, um, for sale. And it merges the two together. Um, so the, the, the bullet point kind of, I tried to encapsulate it 
is cultivation of low trophic level filter feeding species such as seaweed and bivalves shellfish that positively affect the environment. And the trick is to get both the positive environmental impacts and um, have a economic stream that comes out of the product that you grow. Um, so this slide it came from the report, but it kind of, it was actually useful. It's, you know, the reason why Hawaii is just well positioned for restorative aquaculture. Um, as you know, um, as uh, people have been looking at the fish ponds over the years and a lot more closely recently, um, we have a strong cultural foundation based on indigenous roots. And um, also as a community, we have extremely high seafood consumption. It's, I think it's about double what the um, average uh, US citizen eats based on, um, I think it's NOAA data. Um, also, we have some unique local advantages in terms of our climate, and which gives us high levels of productivity. And um, we're able to utilize our isolation as a benefit for biosecurity and um, keep our, our biodiversity that we want to pretty much clean. Um, and through the University of Hawaii and people like Hatch, there's already an existing R&D infrastructure and um, research community. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about restorative aquaculture um, and sustainability, because that's kind of the topic of the night. Um, as you, everybody knows, there's three types of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social. So why is restorative aquaculture and economically sustainable? Um, these are the components that we're working towards. Some of them we have already, but um, a lot would resonate across different um, ag sectors also. So there's direct market opportunities, um, especially with seaweeds and bivalves. They're valuable either both as a food, but also um, value added components such as um, feed, animal feeds, um, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, possibly biofuels and bioplastics, for example. Um, the other side of it is the indirect economic opportunities such as wastewater treatment savings, the blue carbon and nutrient credit markets, which have not been developed yet. They're starting to globally, but we haven't done that yet in Hawaii, of course, and the ability to drive uh, green jobs. On the environmental side, um, really there's the water quality improvement because uh, the seaweeds and the um, bivalves are filters. Uh, they will remove excess nitrogen, phosphorus, and suspended solids from the surrounding environment. Um, climate change, uh, mitigation, adaptation aspects. The, the, oh, the, oh, the, uh, the ability to sequester um, CO2 or carbon and also the ability of the uh, seaweed and the bivalves itself to create better habitats for fish and invertebrates, um, basically creating uh, fish aggregation devices or the other terms of where we, the smaller fish will come, the larger fish will come and it will create a better equals, ecosystem. On the social side, uh, we touched on it a little bit. The, there's already a cultural significance of what's going on with um, the indigenous culture around the seaweed and bivalves. I just have to um, make a note. Uh, we are only looking at indigenous seaweeds and bivalves. We're not going to bring in um, outside species uh, that would, would have an invasive species problem and stuff like that. So again, it's really only the indigenous ones that we've been here before. Um, on the community side, um, we have access to, to better healthy um, food, food and nutritional um, nutrient rich products, um, leads to food security. That's another big issue that we have as a community and also um, the different jobs and um, businesses and wealth creation, et cetera, that can come off of this thing. Okay. so. Here's an example of the community side that's already out there. Um, Maimanalo Limahui is, is an active organization. 
Um, and they are planting limu on, on Waimanalo and um, Oahu to, um, to restore the, the limu fields that have been picked clean. Uh, again, this is just an example of an existing operation or existing um, organization. And um, there are many others out there that we can leverage up and connect to help our efforts. Oops, ah, sorry, that slide kind of was out of, should have been before the Waimanalo things. Another one is YY Ola Water Keepers. And um, they have been working with the University of Hawaii Hilo and the DOD to um, place over 30,000 Hawaiian oysters in the uh, military waters to, to um, verify how it's gonna work and see what kind of impact they have. Um, we wouldn't necessarily eat these oysters because they are filter feeders, but um, they are following the path of the Billion Oyster Project in New York Harbor. And um, they are trying to put a billion oysters out. And as you can tell, 72 million live oysters have been restored, um, 1.8 million pounds of shells collected, and um, many students are engaged in the project. So that's kind of aspirational for us, but it shows that people are, are we are on the same track as others in terms of looking at the restorative benefits of bivalves that can help um, clean up pollution. Um, another existing operation is with the LNRs, Anui Nui Fisheries Research Center here in Oahu. Um, here, volunteers and DLNR staff raise um, seaweed that can, that actually they're giving it out to the Limu Hui's right now. And we need to um, expand that and sort of institutionalize those efforts. And I mentioned that UH Hilo was helping the water keepers. Um, they have a Pacific Aquaculture and Coastal Resource Center, and they also raise, uh, they do both seaweed and juvenile oysters um, at that facility. So these, both Anui Nui and Pakrak are existing, and we definitely can um, provide them more support and expand their efforts. Okay, so what are we talking about for target species? Again, these are all indigenous. Um, so Asparagopsis taxiformis, um, this is the red seaweed that um, you may have read about that uh, they're, they're looking at as a livestock feed, a cattle feed additive to reduce the methane emissions that, that the cow is burping. And um, the local name is Limu Kohu. So that's, there's two companies at Nelha right now that are looking at the commercial aspects of this and um, working on the science to, to keep a steady stream or working out the, the, the feed additive and digestibility of the seaweed, but they know it works. Um, Gracilaria is Ogo, and that's the one that's really common. You see it in the, um, the poke bowls. Um, we're looking at that because it's so common. That's another, these are just two species we're gonna start with. The idea is to look at the, the either as a food, a human food, there's the livestock feed or other uh, value added com um, components that can come off of these things. And um, the research is beginning to start on that. In terms of oysters, um, there's two species that, that the water keepers were looking at to um, deploy in the DOD waters. Um, it's the Hawaiian oyster and the black lip pearl oyster. Both are indigenous to Hawaii. Okay, so moving forward, we're kind of moving quickly through this. Um, this, this information came from the that, um, Hawaii's Opportunity Report. So if you want to review that a little more at your leisure, but I'll just bring it up here. Of course, we need um, to optimize the government framework to reduce regulatory hurdles. Uh, licensing permitting is going to be key to moving this, this segment of the industry forward. And um, some of it has to do with the Department of Ag, some of it has to do with uh, DLNR, and behind DLNR, the federal agencies that look at um, what goes on in the water, like NOAA, Army Corps of Engineers, et cetera. 
So all of those pieces have to be aligned for us to move forward um, with restorative aquaculture. Um, there are definitely, um, globally, there is a huge push into the uh, restorative aquaculture areas uh, research-wise, but we need to build our knowledge based on our indigenous species. So as the slide says, we need to build a research roadmap and create a shared knowledge platform to increase coordination and sharing among stakeholders. Luckily, um, we have the University of Hawaii, we have NOAA, we have a bunch of partners that are doing, um, the, the frameworks are, are there, we just have to focus the topics and um, fund and push for areas that we need to close the knowledge gaps. Um, okay, so there is the, and the next bullet point is really about accelerating innovation. And this is where um, our partners at Hatch and Dylan will talk a little bit more about this, is moving good ideas down, down the path toward commercialization. And um, there's the funding and development. There's a whole, an ecosystem built around that in Hatch, but that's what's going to provide uh, new farmers, new techniques, new innovation has to come through with, with, with this whole process around accelerating innovation. Um, of course, you hear this a lot about different uh, industries, but workforce development is key. And um, so like every other industry, we have to address that. And in general, and this is why I'm on this um, call today, is really talking a little bit more about understanding aquaculture as best as I can explain it and uh, to raise awareness on the benefits and potential beyond just the, our aquaculture community, which I usually talk to. We have to, to get a better understanding in the public so we can get more support on our activities. So um, next steps. Um, as the report stated, they, they suggested, and I agreed, that we should establish a task force of, of industry stakeholders, government officials, and community leaders that would do these things. And it's a little bit aspirational, but I think it's right on. These are the things that we have to work. They're not in sequence, but we have to do push forward on, on, on each topic as best we can so we can we can support an industry growth. So again, it's about streamlining the permitting process. Um, we need to build support and obtain funding for research and development. Um, we need to develop our own best management practices for seaweed and bivalve aquaculture here in Hawaii. Luckily, the BMPs um, are being developed globally, so we don't have to start from zero, but we definitely need our own set. And um, we really have to be able to quantify what we're doing out there. And um, by quantifying the ecosystem services, such as carbon sequestration, we would then be able to, to better potentially find um, service payment platforms, such as carbon credits, or in this case, blue carbon credits, that can help fund and support all of the points above. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, this is my last slide. So again, I'm the manager at ADP. Um, I have one staff. Her name is Liz, and this is our contact. And that's it. Thank you, Todd. Um, that was so informative. We've already got a, a question in from the audience, but I, I want to wait till the end here. Uh, and I'll just immediately kick it over to Dylan. Um, you'd like to share your presentation. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, you can hear me clearly? Yes, you sound great. Uh, if you can pull up my slides. That'd be super. Thanks so much. And, and great talk, Todd. Thanks for, for having me on here. Um, I'll just wait for the slide. So, so my name is Dylan and, and I'm with Hatch. I'm an operations manager here. And I'll just tell you a little about, about myself before we kick into um, the presentation. So on the next slide, uh, I'll just have a quick showcase of, of where I've kind of have come from I was born in South Africa on a fruit farm and have you know worked on farms my whole life and but 
purely from an aquaculture perspective. And when I'm not farming or doing any research, um, I'm scouring the internet, looking for farms and, and uh, trying to understand how farmers work and what they need and what they don't want. Um, I've worked in the Middle East, in Asia, in, in Europe, and even the States, um, and a few few other places. I've closely visited about 250 farms all over the world, and um, have a very good understanding of how, how, how different farming systems work um, in different cultures across the value chain. And, and my role at Hatch is really as a purely um, technical advisor for, for our teams and different business units. Okay, on the next slide, um, I'll just talk you through, uh, you know, aquaculture. You've maybe some of you have seen this slide before. Uh, it's really small on my phone, but I'll try, try and um, see it. So, uh, you know, aquaculture has been around for, for years, but we've primarily um, relied on, on, on wild harvested seafood and, and, you know, in the future, that's not going to be sustainable anymore. And we will need to find, you know, better solutions to um, satisfy our protein diets. And this is where aquaculture has got such a high potential to fulfill those needs as we've really got this massive ocean to, to, to utilize. And there's a lot of natural resources, which, which we can, you know, still um, depend on in the future while we were actually running out of land to, to farm on. Um, okay, so, so in the next slide, uh, you'll see um, the actual growth potential of, of where aquaculture uh, will be in the next 10 to 20 years. And you'll see the variety of farming systems that we will use um, will grow in terms of, uh, you know, um, you know, be all traditional aquaculture systems to more modern and, and alternative uh, seafood resources. Um, and so we expect the, the industry to go substantially um, over the next 20 years, 30 years. Okay, on the next slide, uh, you'll see, uh, okay, so, so this is our, a little bit of our statement. I think we need to mention this um, in the beginning of the, the call, but essentially we, we are a venture capital group with the with purpose and impact to to revolutionize the way we farm seafood and provide uh, you know sustainably cultivated alternative seafood with the whole um, mission to to ensure our oceans or remain and and you know become even more healthier. Okay, the next slide. Um, so, so our mission here, while why we are in Hawaii, is really just to cultivate the you know human and business ecosystem to drive these innovations to, to support uh, the growth of aquaculture in Hawaii and in the United States, and and we do that by um, you know attracting investment into our funds so that we can deploy that into people and projects um, in Hawaii and throughout uh, America. And next slide. Okay, so our business is divided into four different business units. Uh, the most important one is, is our accelerator, student and incubator uh, business unit, and that is headquartered in, in Kona in Hawaii. Um, we have other business units that do corporate innovation services. These are essentially a consulting unit for, you know, much, much larger investors and also um, huge corporations that are interested in investing in aquaculture. Then we have our own fund, the Blue Revolution Fund, which I'll touch on a bit later. And then lastly, we, we are um, owners of a news media site called The Fish Site, too, which is used as a platform to share news and content um, happening in the aquaculture industry around the world. And it really also gives entrepreneurs a platform to share and showcase their stories and how they've succeeded and failed in, in different um, projects and farms. And the next slide. Um, so we started the company in early 2018 with three founders and myself. 
um, in in Norway, and we ran two two programs during that year, and then we incorporated um, a holdings company in Ireland. In the following slide, you'll see um, we've grown our, our team. In the next slide, um, to twenty four people um, just in the last three and a half years, three to four four, four years, and we've opened offices in. In Southeast Asia and Singapore, and of course in in Hawaii. In the following slide, uh, we just showcase that we, we've run four accelerator programs, which we actively invest in in startups. And then we've, in addition, we've run ten innovation studio programs, where these short uh, programs are free for participants. So anyone can apply to them, regardless of which industry you're coming from. So long as you're working on a project that that um, is solving challenges within the aquaculture industry, uh, we've you know grown a global network of mentors and industry stakeholders to, to support these entrepreneurs that we've invested in, and 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 in addition to the other teams and um, companies that join the studio programs, and we've. Invested in about six, just over six and a half million dollars over the course of the last three and a half years, and those companies have gone on to uh, raise an additional one hundred and ten million dollars after joining our, our programs, and those are just from the thirty-five companies. So we we feel that you know these companies are, are growing and they're employing people and feeding families, and uh, creating jobs and also create creating impact on, on the aquaculture industry and ocean. Okay, um, next slide. Um, in terms of uh, the following slide, sorry. Yeah, so this is essentially uh, our um, areas where Hatch focuses in terms of uh, how um, or in different stages of, of, of a company's life cycle. So Essentially, when you start a company, it's all based on you know market research and doing R and D in in your minimum minimum viable products. Then you start to you know employ people and then start selling you know your first version of product. Then that's essentially um, referred to as a startup. And then once you gain traction, um, substantial crack traction in the industry then in your at that takeoff stage and in all three stages we actively support uh, companies in the first stage we, we run these innovation studios and, and we'll launch an incubator platform next month and this is really targeted at, at very early pre pre-seed stage um, companies or, or teams and the next stage is our accelerator which each company that's successful that successfully gets into the program will, will um, receive two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, and then we have another fund which is targeted at slightly late, later stage companies that could uh, receive anything between five hundred k and, and five million dollars. Okay, next slide. In terms of aquaculture, if, if you're not familiar, there is a quite a large, um, you know, supply chain within within the industry. Um, you know, outside outside of Hawaii, in in more the established countries, and in Asia, where you have different stakeholder groups, the suppliers, the farmers, and then the processors and of course your consumers, and we realize and, and navigate the supply chain to identify the highest um, contributors of most important sectors that create value for farmers and consumers. In terms of what we invest in, in the next slide, uh, we've identified key areas of, of investment opportunity and where we think can make the greatest impact on the future of aquaculture and, and the economy. And this is really around regenerative aquaculture is very, very important for us in our investment thesis. And then definitely around next generation aquaculture, novel production systems, nutrition is a very important um, sector, enabling technology versus our software and hardware companies, health and genetics, you know, 
downstream services like logistics and finance solutions, and of course, alternative seafood like plant-based seafood and sub-based seafood. In the next slide, um, we have actively been following innovation in, in the aquaculture industry for the last four years, and we've built up a big database of close to 108, sorry, 1,800 companies. The slide is a little bit outdated, but essentially you can see where most of these countries come from is the United States. And that's exactly why we, we established an office here to, um, to support those companies. And then the, the rest of the companies largely come from Norway, Ireland, uh, India, Indonesia, and some other Asian countries. And in terms of different sectors, most of those startups are focusing on nutrition, which is a primary driver for success in the aquaculture industry um, and other sectors like equipment and novel production systems. And the next slide, um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'll just You're quickly- We've got about 15 minutes left and we just wanna save a couple minutes for some audience questions. So you're good. I'll rather leave more time for questions. So I'll, I'll speed up. Um, I just wanted to showcase some success stories that we've supported in Hawaii. Um, and the first one is Symbrosia. They are a startup that have come from the East Coast and they then established a company here in, in the Big Island. And they're addressing, um, sorry, the helicopter going past here. Um, they're addressing the, the um, uh, emissions from, from dairy and, and beef uh, by producing this uh, seaweed that can, can help reduce those emissions. And then another company called Kuna Agrosystems, they're based on in Honolulu, and they're also producing an algae-based product that can um, be used for food and feeds, and also um, beauty and health products. And the next slide, um, there's another company called Minotech, which is a company based in Kauai, and they are solving a, a world, a, a huge challenge across the world. Um, helping shrimp farmers, not only in Hawaii, but also in Asia and South, South America, enabling shrimp farmers to, to actually see in the water where the shrimp live in, in turbid, turbid uh, environments and, and help the farmers better understand, you know, how many shrimp they have in their ponds and if they're growing fast, how many are surviving and if they're healthy and happy. Another um, example of a company that have spore, uh, spun out of university, and I use this example to try and encourage students at universities here in Hawaii to, to realize that there is opportunity to, to take your learnings and research and, and commercialize that and to help, to help you know, society and, and Hawaiians. And this company essentially... Uh, this gentleman from Arizona State University, he was working on cancer research and he was using an assay, which he realized was also beneficial and applicable to the aquaculture industry. And he used that, uh, his, his, his learnings to develop a device that measures the metabolic rate of fertilized salmon eggs and thus enabling farmers to quickly identify the good eggs from the bad eggs, which then helps the hatcheries um, you know, become much more efficient in only growing those, those eggs that are you know, proven to be strong and healthy instead of farming you know, the poor or weak fish or oysters or shrimp. Now the farms can really just be focused on growing healthy, strong animals. Okay, next slide. Um, the next slide. You're right there. Okay, so, um, you know, Todd mentioned a lot about um, Hawaii and, 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 you know, the reason why Hatch is here and also our efforts with the report. But I'll, I will just, you know, let you know what 
what we will be doing in Hawaii and why we're here um, and, and how the, the locals can get, get involved and, and get support from Hatch. So we plan to run an accelerator program in, in Kona uh, next year where entrepreneurs have the opportunity to, to apply to that and, and receive the funding and they will get a training program of, of you know, 15 weeks from us and we will take them around the world to, to expose them how you know, other folks farm and, and potentially bring those learnings back to Hawaii to, 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 to you know, generate um, the industry here. The other programs we, we will have is a studio program, which will be free. Uh, that's a much shorter program, which a mini MBA program in, in two weeks, and it's very agriculture centric. And then we have, we will launch an innovation incubator platform at the end of November, where anyone um, in Hawaii who's working on agriculture solutions or would like to do research on agriculture, um, they can come here. It'll be heavily subsidized, if not free, uh, to, to utilize the facilities here and to have an office space. But I can touch on that on, on the next slide. Okay, um, yeah, we can move them to the next slide. So we're based out of the Noha campus um, in the bottom left-hand side of this map. Um, if anyone's been to Noha, you'll, you'll notice that as you're driving in, there is a, a 55 residents um, that rent land from, from the Noha Institute. Um, and those are mostly, if all, um, aquaculture ranches. And we are based on in, in, in Noha. And this is essentially a perfect place for entrepreneurs to come and do their research. They have access to clean, crystal clean, and uh, clear water where they don't have to worry about any biosecurity. They can also have access to cold and hot water um, where they can then create any environment to, to do their research. And there's a very varied amount of species from abalone to shellfish to shrimp to fish to seahorses, octopus, algae, seaweed, etc. Okay, and the next slide. So the thank you better platform is really uh, for anyone to to come. Uh, you have to apply to to the platform, and it is merit based or criteria based. Um, where you know those successful applicants can come and use the space for free um, for any amount of time, depending on you know, the different milestones and KPIs that we set. And then you have access to the labs, um, the wet and dry labs. You can set up systems or use existing systems to do your research um, and work on, on your innovation. And, and this is really open to anyone from students to grad students to researchers, any teams or startups, small companies or, or even later stage companies that need support. Um, in addition, you will get access to, to me, to my support and, and uh, the rest of our team around the world. And we will host many community activities um, for those participants to network the, with the local um, industry and um, globally. I think that's it from me. I'm more than happy to share any for more, more information um, or you can reach out to me on email or, or friend. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dylan. Um, I'd love to invite you to stay on camera and uh, Todd, if you could come back. Um, thank you both for all this information. We do have a couple of uh, attendee questions that I'd love to start out with, and you guys can jump in on, uh, on whichever one uh, you feel you can answer. Um, our first question this evening comes from Susie, uh, excuse me, Sue from Oahu. Uh, she says, we should definitely develop aquaculture, but I have a question. 
How is aquaculture affected by the prevalence of microplastics in the oceans? She says, I believe we'll discover it adversely affects every aspect of our health. And if it's present in seawater, surely it would be present in flora or fauna that live in the ocean. Can either of you address that concern? Mm, I don't believe I have the background to address that. That's a, that's a valid concern. I hear you, Susie or Susan. Um, um, you know, I don't know how to address that. I think that's part of the research that we're going to have to do. Um, microplastics are, are definitely a, a topic of discussion uh, globally, right? And not just for Hawaii. So how we're going to deal with them, how we're going to address that, that large, I don't know what even they call it, right? That big area of garbage and has plastics and everything else in it. it, it, it I believe it has its own ecosystem even now. The garbage and, patch, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, small fish and big fish and, and flora, you know, the seaweeds probably grow there. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that's probably what we're going to have to discover, but not only just for, for restorative aquaculture, but for, for fisheries and for aquaculture in general, all the ocean economy. Um, that is a, that's a big topic. Um, I don't know what else to add to that. Dylan, do you have anything to add? Oh, oh Dylan, you cut out or I'm not sure if you're on mute. Excuse me. I'm still living in 1929, 2019. Um, I was gonna say, I had a conversation with a colleague of mine from when I was still living in Singapore, who worked for a large um, company that did testing and um, tests uh, you know, for for water quality around Singapore, and this is definitely a huge problem in Singapore. And they had done a lot of tests, um, but didn't find any human effects. Um, and for, and and I need to get proper data to validate this. Um, but when I do, I'm more than happy to send it on to Susan. That's that's um, no problem. It is a, definitely a global problem and not only an issue for, for seafood, the seafood industry. Yeah, thank you guys for that, that candid response. And thank you, Sue, for the question. We have one other question here from Paul, uh, and he's interested in knowing how to set up a mini scale aquaponics. Um, you know, I, I don't know if either of you can share, is that feasible to do at home in the backyard? Do you need a lot of capital to do this? Can you watch YouTube videos and figure it out? Do you have any sort of where to, to point Paul um, to, to kind of learn more about this? Yeah, there's a ton of information on the internet. Um, well, there's, there's University of Hawaii and other universities, but Hawaii I know has um, information on establishing um, small scale systems, uh, but also the internet. If you look at um, YouTube videos, they go through step by step of what you need to do. Um, again, it depends on the size and scale of what you're doing, but you can start with a very small system, even based on a small aquarium that's in your house and learn the basics and then expand from there. Um, that's the beauty of this thing. The, the trick is, is when you get to scale. And that's really when it gets much harder. Um, we know that, uh, you know, kids set up small aquaponic systems, no problem. And things grow nicely, the fish are happy. Once you balance the number of fish and the, the plants. But when you're at scale, things go sideways and um, you have to have a skill set, two skill sets, one to keep your fish alive and one to keep the plants growing. And typically that's hard to find in one person on a commercial level. I know I kind of devolved, but that's that's kind of what we're looking at at the at the commercial level. Uh, we've got another question in here um, popping up just now. How many Native Hawaiians are you working with? This this may be a question for Dylan. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Um, how many Native Hawaiians are you working with and how do local communities feel about aqu aquaculture farms when traditional aquaculture is trying to be restored? Um, can either of you take that one? 
Sure. Uh, so the first answer, uh, first section of the question, we are actively looking to to work with more native Hawaiian folks. We've we've had native Hawaiians in our programs before, um, in the two previous uh, years, um, but we would love to to engage with more folks uh, for the programs coming up. And the second part of that question, how do agriculture, uh, how do local people feel about aquaculture so, so you know traditionally aquaculture uh in its form has been kind of for years i mean hundreds of years in hawaii um but at the traditional small scale um you know culturally they you know we definitely want to preserve um those systems in in the ponds and, and um However, when we talk about future aquaculture at a, you know, to feed thousands of people, we will come up with different ways in different systems to grow those, um, those that feed food. Um, and it's just about um, creating a formula that works for both natives, uh, you know, for both new systems and and the the ponds that exists already um so so it's just about education and helping locals understand how you know aquaculture works um and how it needs to work in the future um in addition to and in parallel with with the pond agriculture today great Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Todd. Time's about up. I'm going to kick it over to Roger, but but thanks for all the knowledge you shared tonight. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, both of you. Um, I learned a great deal, and I will certainly be coming back to you both for programming next year, probably around April, May, to guide me to the <clears throat> most interesting, productive topics. Uh, but I was... <clears throat> really excited by this report and by the possibilities. And uh, it's just great that Hatch Blue is um, headquartered here in Hawaii. That's amazing in itself. I mean, that's a huge sign uh, for us. And uh, aloha, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Thank